schools, and also the Camera Club board president. He'll be introducing Mariette um, Allen. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, and sorry for the sight lines over here. Um, maybe for Marriott, we'll try to move it. I don't know if we should move it. Does it move easily? You can decide when you come up. Um, I'll let you play with that. So, um, I've known Marriott Pathy Allen for many years. And uh, I had the pleasure of helping her edit her landmark, remarkable book, Gender Frontier, which came out in 2003. And over the years, I've also had the pleasure of meeting many of her portrait subjects with whom she has deep and supportive relationships that inspire this ongoing body of work. Her documentation of the political activism within the transgender movement of the 1990s is historic, and her ongoing in-depth portraiture on the subject over the last 30 years constitutes one of the important portrait archives in contemporary photography. She graduated from Vassar and then went on to do an MFA at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1987, she got a grad from the New York State Council for the Arts, and in 1988, her first book appeared called Transformations, Crossdressers, and Those Who Love Them. And, and in 2003, her other book on transgender was published, uh, the one I referred to, Gender Frontier, published by the German publisher Kehrer in Heidelberg. Um, Marriott also did the stills and was a consultant on the award-winning HBO documentary Southern Comfort about a group of transgender friends who lived in rural Georgia. Uh, so Marriott, I'm happy to introduce you and then we'll try to um, see. So it's those people who can't see you. Maybe they can, would you like to move? No, you're happy oh, sure. as you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much, Alan and the Camera Club and School of Visual Arts and all of you who got here. I'm I'm delighted to be speaking to such a varied and interesting audience. Um, and I will. Uh, I decided that tonight to show you a little bit of where I'm coming from rather than just the transgender work. So um, if you're not interested in anything but transgender, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, as Alan mentioned, I actually I've been a paint, I was started to be a painter when I was a child and assumed that my life would be a, an art teacher. Didn't turn out that way. Um, so I'm going to just quickly show you a few of the paintings that I did and mention uh, some of, this was in the pop art period and I thought, well, I'm going to use ordinary things and put them on a table. That's a carton of milk and a toothpaste uh, box and, um, and this also is, uh, I was very interested always in collage as well as painting and um, uh, one of the things that has always interested me is um, the, the field, what's in front, what's in back, the depth of field, and trying to make that um, not only confusing, but sort of even like a drum, so that you go back and forth and you're not sure quite where everything is. Um, and then this painting uh, represents towards the end of when I kind of stopped painting, it's, um, it was a photograph that I projected onto canvas and then painted. Um, when I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, by a total fluke, a friend of mine introduced me to a, a, a great teacher and photographer named Harold Feinstein, 
there are people in this audience who also studied with Harold, and we are sort of bonded for life for that experience. Um, Harold made me think that photography was something that I didn't have to be nervous about. I didn't have to worry about anything except being able to see and being able to um, respect whatever it was that I saw. This, um, so I, you'll see if some other pictures that I took. This picture also represents a job that I got, which was um, at the State Museum of New Jersey in Trenton. Um, and I commuted, I probably was the only one commuting from Philadelphia to Trenton. Um, and this is 30th Street Station, Philadelphia. And if you notice, it also has something of the sense of what's in front, what's in back, and that spatial confusion that I really like. Um, in the area where I lived in Philadelphia, I saw this sign every time I went anywhere. And I think it, um, it in a way, shocked the feminist in me. Uh, this was also in the neighborhood where I lived in Philadelphia. And the job that I had at the State Museum of New Jersey was to go around and photograph what the curator called the face of New Jersey. He had seen the exhibition, The Family of Man, and um, so he was inspired by that. And I'm just showing this image, um, but it was a great job, as you can imagine. Um, Another job that I got was to uh, photograph for a television station Philadelphia artists. And so I had, that was a great opportunity. This picture represents not only the Philadelphia artist, um, whose name I can't remember at the moment, but also the beginning of a series that I call People with Art, which is an ongoing series, although I haven't done any of it for a while, but it started at the same time. and. Um, like the picture of the sign that you saw in my neighborhood, it's again um, kind of the woman in a sort of a passive position and um, the man <laughs> in sort of the active one and, and the plane of um, uh, the, the front and the depth um, is hopefully a little confusing. Um, after I moved from Philadelphia back to New York, which is where I'm from, um, I took this picture at the uh, Mermaid Parade. Um, I thought it had a similar, it's, quite, it's taken quite a bit later, but I thought it had a similar feeling to the one I just showed you. Moving back to New York from Philadelphia, I was kind of in between painting and photography, didn't quite know what I should call myself. And um, I photographed flowers for quite a while and because I thought it had the painterly feeling that I liked. Um, and in this case, I superimposed a flower on top of, actually was a wrapping paper from a florist. So um, I liked, I, I experimented with that idea of um, combining uh, foreground, background, uh, real things with uh, not real things. This is a picture of um, of my, a flower reflected in mylar, and on that reflection is one of my paintings. So I um, uh, worked again with it, with a similar idea. And then this picture, I don't know if you can tell exactly, it's a combination of flowers and a dancer, which is something I kept trying. I got very involved in photographing dance when I uh, came back to New York. And one of the things I did was work with a number of dance companies to create images that would sometimes um, emphasize the piece or give the um, dancers a little bit of time between different uh, movements. Um, so they would be projected with the piece. This is one example, which is a collage, and it has photographs of some of the performers. And this is another piece. Um, this photographer played 11 different characters, if you can imagine that. 
So in between each character change, um, my pictures were projected to give us a moment to change character. And here are a couple of examples of some of the uh, photographs that I took in those days. Um, <laughs> this picture was published in Stern, by the way, um, for those who are interested in that. Um, environmental pieces were very popular. And then I got another great job, which was I worked for the Department of Cultural Affairs at New York City. Department of Cultural Affairs, and uh, my job was to document through photography and video um, the events that were sponsored by the Department of Cultural Affairs. This picture is dancing on Broadway. And this was um, setting up before New Year's Eve in Central Park, which uh, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs made an attempt to make, which succeeded in making Central Park feel much safer and especially around the holidays. I also had the privilege of working, uh, documenting a lot of things at Studio 54. I had a friend who um, designed a lot of these events. So this was a Valentine's Day picture and I'm not, I'm actually not going to show you any more of Studio 54. Um, when I lost, I eventually lost my job at the Department of Cultural Affairs. I was one of Mayor Beam's budget cuts. So I decided to have children. <laughs> it was a good timing. Uh, this was my first daughter. Um, And because I was unable to have natural childbirth, I was really devastated about that, I decided to heal myself by photographing other people's births. Um, and this picture represents that. It also, I have used it in some of my um, presentations on transgender because I call this picture the last gender-free moment. And then I had another child. Um, and this is chocolate pudding. Um, and it's a good lead in to the next picture because I also was during that time creating fantasies doing, um, I, I have a series that I called um, Fantasy Found and Created. And I'll just show you two images of created fantasies. I did paint on people, and without knowing how they would handle the poison, <laughs> some dramatic times. And so this picture leads me into, you could say, one of the greatest fantasies of my life. Um, which is not just fantasy, but reality. Um, this photograph represents the exact moment of my um, relationship with the transgender community. I was in New Orleans for Mardi Gras in 1978 and stayed in the same hotel as this group of people. Um, I came down for breakfast on the last day of Mardi Gras and encountered a room full of really interesting looking people who invited me to join them for breakfast. And uh, right after breakfast, they all got up and started parading around the swimming pool, which was right outside the dining room. And then, um, as if on cue, they all stood in a line and somebody started taking pictures and I thought, well, maybe it's okay for me to take a picture too. I had no idea. Um, and so and if you look at this picture, you see that there are four people um, on one side, four people on the other side, and they're all looking in different directions. And right in the middle, in this silver skirt and black hair, is a person looking directly back at me. And um, I raise the camera to my eyes, and uh, some amazing, amazing things happened to me. I felt like I was not looking at 
a man or a woman, but somehow the essence of a human being. And I also felt I have to have this person in my life. Turned out that she lived 20 blocks away from me in New York. And her name was Vicki West. Um, and it's because of her that actually I'm standing here in front of you. So I'll tell you how that happened. Um, Vicki, uh, I became friends with Vicki both as a man and as a woman. As a, um, she had, she was, had a life as an artist both in both ways. Um, as a man, she was the art director for, at Abrams Books, which is a very um, well-respected art publication. And so she worked there as Dirk Likes. And uh, then, uh, after hours, weekends, other times, she was Vicki West. And uh, I'm showing you these pairs of shoes because they both belong to the same person. That's Vicki when we went, we went to, after a while, after being in her life and going to places, she eventually invited me to um, go to Fantasia Fair, which is a, um, an annual event in Provincetown, Massachusetts. It lasts for a whole week. And at that time, it was primarily, it consisted primarily of male to female cross-dressers um, and um, sometimes spouses as well. And so I went up there, um, not knowing what to expect, having met some, some trans people, but usually just one or two at a time. Suddenly there were 80. And it was kind of, it took me a while to sort of adjust, but obviously I did. Um, what I like about this, well, first of all, Vicki idolized Rita Hayworth. I think you can see that in this picture. Um, and I loved the way she, kind, she got really relaxed as Vicky and sort of um, maybe more vulnerable. I'm sh just going to quickly show you a couple of her images. As Vicky, she worked for Drag Magazine and a lot of other magazines and made signage and all kinds of things, uh, some of which were quite fetishistic. She is, and, um, I, if you're interested in seeing her work, I have a lot of it on my website. I have a section for Vicki West. Um, you could, what's wonderful with a lot of the images, you can see her whole process from sketching to um, lithograph to uh, print to whatever. And I, I love that, that you can, you, and she kept it all. Um, I should say Vicki died about five years ago and um, didn't have uh, really family left. And so her um, roommate, uh, well, I was the only other person really besides her roommate who was very uh, close to her. And I came over to, and we went through the, all of her things. And I discovered that there were a whole bunch of Saks Fifth Avenue shopping bags. Um, sort of just standing there, and inside of all those bags were all this fantastic art, magazines, books, art of all kinds, and they were in pristine condition, even though they were kept in shopping bags. I took them all, um, decided that they needed to be put in an archive, exhibited, and presumably also published, and I'm happy to tell you that uh, I have found a place for her work. It's the Fales Library at NYU. And the um, head of that is thrilled to have her work. So we're just, we're just working out the details with it now. Um, at this early, I'm going to talk to you. I have to do this in decades, unfortunately. I, I was originally thinking I'll just show you all my best pictures and forget about it, but I think I need to do this um, chronologically to some extent. Um, this is a picture of um, somebody at Fantasia Fair who um, loved the glamour image, um, traditional sort of glamour image that was in, in the 80s. And I've spent hours with her up in the dunes of Cro Provincetown, and then it started getting cold. And suddenly, um, 
she grabbed her fur coat in her arms like this, and I suddenly had the feeling that I was seeing a little girl with a teddy bear, and I felt like, oh, I mean, this is really Valerie. And um, it's, I was, um, when that happens, there's something very moving that, that takes place. One of the things that I have always tried to get in my images is some combination of vulnerability and dignity. And somebody recently, a critic, said to me, they're, they're self-contradictory, but I don't think so at all. Um, this, is the, this is an example of how I got started, really, in photographing, uh, primarily cross-dressers in the beginning. Uh, most of them had never been photographed by anybody at all. And, and many, I mean, in the 80s particularly, cross-dressers were full of shame and fear, embarrassment, feeling sinful, feeling like they were perverted, feeling like, I mean, very low self-confidence. Um, I mean, essentially, all the media portrayal in the past had been very negative. They had been shown as isolated and bizarre and essentially unacceptable people. Well, um, I saw that I actually had a job to do with this. I um, decided I wanted to, and I decided it was obvious to me, I needed to portray them in a way that brought up um, a window, of, a positive window to them uh, so that they could see themselves in a, in a different way and also so that the outside world could see them in a different way. Um, and so in the process of working with them, I, I learned a lot of things about what to do that I wouldn't have thought to, that I needed to tell anybody in, generally when making portraits, like see yourself as a three-dimensional person. You're allowed to take up a certain kind, amount of space. You're allowed to move. You don't have to stand like a, um, you're, you're waiting for a, um, a passport picture to be taken. Um, so I, I tried all different ways to get people to move, to make shapes, to, um, and to sort of absorb it themselves into who they felt they were, at least some of the time, to let that part of them come out. So this is a, a person who's still a friend of mine. Her name is Allison. During the session, she was crying because it was the first time she felt released to be Allison. And this is Allison, I can tell you, four years later. You see, she um, got comfortable. The other th I mean, there were so many things that fascinated me in the beginning. I wanted to see how a person felt about themselves um, when they were in masculine, cl in men's clothing and in, in women's clothing, and how that affected them. So I did a number of diptychs. I'm just showing you one. But um, in many cases, well, I was also extremely interested in body language. I'd never told people how to pose in these cases. And very often I found that the self-confidence, well, it varied. Sometimes the self-confidence, as you can see in this picture, uh, changes um, incredibly um, from a very shy person to something almost like a hussy. Another, another example of changing. If you look at the, the body positions, I find it amazing. This is a married couple, and the wife felt that she was uh, very comfortable with her husband's cross-dressing, so I tried an experiment. I couldn't use their faces, which didn't matter in this case, and I photographed her with Len, and then again with Linda, and so then we scrutinized the differences, and I saw that perhaps she does have some hesitation about this, if you look at them. Um, one of the first things that I wanted to do once I sort of established myself in this community was to photograph um, cross-dressers with their partners to show that, in fact, they are lovable, <laughs> generally. And um, so when I came to, and I also, you probably notice, I've, I use color and black and white, and then I, 
I used to go with two cameras, one had color, one had black and white, and then decide on the, on the spot or sometimes use both. And you can see what, that I didn't have to make any decision in this case. When the dog came bounding out, I just knew what I had to do. Anyway, this is, uh, so this is an early picture of a couple. And this is a much more recent image of a couple and um, they're learning line dancing here. You can see how much more relaxed. I mean, I know this is just a sample of two couples, but nevertheless, I think they represent um, gradual um, feelings of uh, com greater comfort. This was taken in the 90s. So then the next hurdle, I thought, was photographing transgender people with their children. This was something that just wasn't done. Um, people were, a lot of the conversation at conferences was, should we tell the children? If so, when should we tell the children? Should it be right from the beginning? Should it be when they're adolescents? Should it be never? And this was endless worry. You could certainly not bring a child to a convention. The first time people did that, everybody was scandalized. So anyway, you can, I'm trying to tell you how difficult this was. Um, so I used Vicky. Um, I decided the only way I can, could get a few people to do this was to show them that kids could survive the experience of being with a transgender person. So these are my daughters dancing the can-can with Vicky West. So here's a... Yeah. Um, they were wonderful. Uh, this is another couple that I have photographed over the years. This picture was taken very, uh, about four, you know, five years ago. At that time, they had, that, that was their first child. Uh, now, I just saw them again recently. They live in California. I was there. And they now have, she's now four, and they have one-year-old twin boys. You can imagine what their lives are like now, but um, they're surviving. Um, so this takes me about children to another direction. Um, this picture is of Felicity, who I photographed in the early 80s. The photograph in her living room um, is of Felicity when, when he was a child J little John, who was going to be getting his first haircut that day, was photographed with his mother by his father. And um, then he went and had his haircut, and that was it. They borrowed the clothing of the little girl from across the street. And then the pictures were put in the attic, and at the age of 12, John discovered these pictures, and it brought back the positive feelings uh, from that day, uh, the, the fluttery clothes, the, just the, t the attention, the, the whole thing. And he started cross-dressing uh, then at 12. He uh, was a lifelong aviator and um, had, a, had a very good life, married twice, had lots of children and grandchildren, and lived to be 101, just, just died two years ago. And I photographed him again right almost before he died, or she died, and she was, uh, she was in the same position in front of the same picture. Okay, this is um, another person that I met early on. Uh, her name was Kay, and she was a green beret. I always liked that it rhymes. Um, and Kay... Um, was very much into BDSM. It, um, this room is sort of dungeon-esque. And um, Kay worked during the week as a bus driver, and then during the weekends, all hell broke loose. I, <laughs> um, I spent one weekend there with a friend, and um, I looked in her closet at one point, and, and there were all these high heels that were either black or red or red and black. And uh, it was fascinating. But the reason I also bring up Kay is that while a lot of the people in the transgender community 
felt that cross-dressing was just a way of feeling, um, of getting out of the difficulty of being in the man, man's role of, um, uh, and feeling greater comfort, feel, feeling greater emotional ease and enjoying the attractiveness of the clothes, there was also always an underground, um, an undercurrent of underground that I knew was there. And that did involve a lot of um, BDSM and um, eroticism of all kinds. And um, um, I'm going to just show you one person who was one of the most helpful people I've ever met. He let me, he not just let me, he uh, wanted me to photograph him. In, I, photo, I have a series of 12 pictures of the same person um, as Bob or as Melinda or as androgynous and with every kind of person, with men, with women, with other transgender people um, or alone. And um, I, I just thought, it was, it was such an act of generosity. Maybe it was exhibitionism on, on her part, but it didn't matter. It was, I, I, it was a great gift. Um, this picture, believe it or not, is in the collection of the New York Public Library. Um, so I had the opportunity to know, the, know about various undercurrents while also, uh, various levels. It was, you know, like train tracks all happening kind of simultaneously. And I, I think it was um, very good for me to know that, it, that there is such a range. Um, uh, also at that time, I had the privilege of going to some of the drag balls in Harlem. Um, this is way before uh, Paris is burning and got to know some of those people. And uh, this was a friend, Carrie, who's no longer with us. So that was before, that was getting ready for a ball. This is during one, believe it or not. They usually started around midnight on a Saturday and would end up around noon on a Sunday. This is at eight in the morning. I had just wanted, I asked this contestant if she would mind if we went up into the daylight for a little while. I was just having enough of the dark. And I had just gotten her next to Jim Jensen with his striped tie when, to my astonishment, a jogger came along um, in orange and black. So to complement the picture, um, anyway, it's one of those moments when you really are happy to be a photographer. Um, in the 90s, um, political activism, starting around 93, became uh, really important. The transgender community had made a uh, had made a big step forward in the sense of not willing to be as passive and to accept and not willing to accept authority figures like doctors, lawyers who um, who used to be in a position to always tell them what they had to do, how they had to behave, etc. I mean, um, and to finally s decide that, that they needed to start fighting against discrimination in every area, employment, housing, um, health, you name it. And um, there are very, very few laws in the United States that um, uh, forbid uh, discrimination against transgender people. So. It's been incredible since the early 90s how much has happened and also still how much is still to be done. This was the first press conference in Washington, D.C. About 100 people came from all over the country. It was an extraordinary event. There were many, during the 90s, um, there was a lot of rushing about all over the country as there were more and more demonstrations and other activities all over the map, things going on. Local, a lot of local people making uh, making changes. Uh, the other area for political activism, which is still shameful, is that more transgender people are murdered than any other group. I mean, it happens 
that we know of at least several times a month in some part of the states, probably a lot more that has not been reported. So now uh, people started to demonstrate because most people are not even aware of these. These are very brutal murders, generally speaking. Um, very, very harsh. Um, this is at a gay pride parade in 95. And as you see on the poster, I don't know. If, yeah, you can see on the poster. Um, this happened, uh, this is right after the Brandon, Brandon Tina murder. I, um, if you've seen the film Boys Don't Cry, um, that's what it was about. And the gay pride parade in itself um, was a very political issue because in the past, um, the people organizing the gay pride did not want transgender people marching in their parade. Drag queens were fine, but not transgender people. And if they insisted on marching, they wouldn't let them march together. So uh, this is a picture where two uh, very disparate um, people in the parade are actually looking at each other. Um, I bring up this, this is my friend James, um, who is a major activist and probably the best known a uh, female to male transgender person in the world. He has done everything anybody can do to bring out visibility for a female to male because a lot of time nobody even knows uh, because they, they disappear into society. Uh, this is another person who's been, to me anyway, but, no, not just to me, to many people, very important. A lot of the problems that transgender people have had has to do with religion, and especially the more orthodox uh, or rigid uh, religions, where they are still told that they are evil, that uh, you know God made them one way, and what are they doing changing God's art? And uh, basically that they are just uh, depraved people. So Holly, among others, had enough of this, and she started an organization called Kindred Spirits. And they, they somewhat based on Native American tribal culture and, uh, and then t bringing in other aspects. They, uh, they have a, com there's a community in uh, Black, Black Mountain, Georgia, no, sorry, North Carolina, that, um, that gathers, they, um, they do a, a lot of tribal rituals, drumming, um, sweat lodge, um, vision quest, many of these things, and also theatrical events. And uh, um, this has been another side that has been constantly developing the relationship to the authority of the church and greater acceptance, by the way, from diff different churches. Okay, that brings me to uh, Tony, who uh, had always uh, thought she, first of all, let me say she was a sheriff in Florida when I met her, okay. She had always identified or thought that her only choice of person was to be a very, very butch dyke and growing up had always thought that she should be a boy. Her father was Native American and was perfectly accepting of having a daughter who he treated just as another son was not a problem. But she was not happy identifying um, as a lesbian. And when she discovered, and that was really mid-90s, that there were transgender people, including female to males, she became ecstatic. Now, you might wonder, what are we doing in a swamp uh, with uh, Tony covered with mud? I mean, it's not your usual image, probably. Um, this was a celebration the day before Tony was scheduled to have um, her first surgery, which was double mastectomy, top, which is called top surgery. Um, and I got in the habit, I would fly down to Florida whenever anything would happen to Tony or his family. This is Tony two years later. We are shooting each other, same place. Um, 
continuing with something of the Native American theme, um, this is Rena Swifthawk blessing her lover, Marissa, both of whom are um, transsexual. Um, Rena Swifthawk, who used to be a, a Native American medicine man, transitioned, became a Native American medicine woman. And um, you can see in this picture, the feather is very, has to be straight, was very meaningful. The feather um, had healing properties and um, feathers. And if you notice that the um, IV drip and the feather are in parallel, are parallel, and I always thought that's wonderful because it's Western medicine and Native American medicine working together to heal somebody. Okay, and I just want to mention about surgery because um, I've had a lot of experience looking at surgeries. Um, this is a friend of mine who um, had facial feminization surgery and reading left to right, um, the first picture was of her, uh, um, uh, the way she looked about four years before the picture. Then, then the other five pictures are of uh, the surgery and how she looks more or less now. The reason she had surgery was not because she disliked, she was always a very good looking person, but when people would look at her, they would turn around and look again, a second look, and it was the second look that she wanted to lose, get rid of it. Um, I have to tell you a very complicated story. I don't know if you can handle it. Um, one of the, it, one of the, uh, the person, the little person there is, is a guy named Maxwell, who I knew for a long time at Southern Comfort, which is another convention. And um, when he invited me to come to Florida to visit them, uh, he, at, at, well, they began, this couple began as Karen and Peggy Sue. Peggy Sue was Maxwell. And they were a lesbian couple living outside of Chicago, working in factory. They, just, uh, they were a couple, and uh, Maxwell was tired of being known as Peggy Sue and looking the way he looked. And well, he, so they decided to move to Florida so that Max could transition, and he did. And they were actually able to get legally married. Um, <clears throat> so then they were... And so that was great for a while until Karen said <clears throat> she also needed to transition. And so suddenly they went from, in, within 12 years, they went from being a gay female couple to a heterosexual couple to a gay male couple. And that's not the end of it. <laughs> that's just the introduction. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so Jake decided he, to leave Maxwell for a woman he met online in California and disappeared. Maxwell was heart, heartbroken. Um, so he moved eventually to Atlanta, Georgia, which has a very large transgender community, very large and accepting and active. Where? He met this wonderful woman, Carissa. I don't know, are, if, if some of you have seen Southern Comfort, you'll know this story already, but I'm going to assume that you haven't. Um, Carissa had always identified as a drag queen. She was about six foot tall. She performed in cabarets, nightclubs, and she was really beautiful. And um, Maxwell is, is a little guy. He's five foot two. She used to refer to him as Munchkin Man. Um, they fell deeply in love. Even, and it was, what's, what's wonderful about this also is that, as, as Carissa put it very delicately, she had never been with anybody with female parts. And Maxwell had had really no experience in the other direction. And yet, um, 
and yet sort of an unheard of relationship in a way develops. What, that's one of the things I love about the transgender community, that things you sort of assume can't happen or wouldn't happen or it's you know, unreasonable to expect do happen and it's a liberating effect. This is Maxwell shaving Carissa's legs. And um, Maxwell's best friend, was named, whose name was Robert, <clears throat> um, lived in Florida right near him. And Robert had transitioned from female to male a long time ago, but had never had a hysterectomy, had just had top surgery. His doctor said it wasn't necessary. And Robert was always really too uncomfortable to go and have, um, uh, go to an OBGYN, so he never went. At a certain point, he had, he got ovarian cancer. Um, and, but by then he was in Atlanta also. Uh, Maxwell had suggested that he move too. Um, he was pretty sick. The, um, some, he asked some friends to find him a doctor. They contacted 17 doctors in three hospitals and nobody would take him as a patient. Here he was. Uh, really ill. Finally, a month later, a doctor in rural Georgia was willing to take him on as a patient, but it was pretty late by then. However, on the, on the happier side of this story, um, he had just met Lola, um, who mostly looked fairly androgynous, but was um, also a um, basically a male to female cross-dresser. And Robert and Lola became a very loving couple. This picture was taken, a, a, as Alan said, in, in rural Georgia, where um, Robert had a sort of a cabin. And he made the Easter meal. And um, so, we were all there for Easter. It was a lovely occasion. This is Robert in the beginning of September. He um, was barely alive at that point. He, but he was determined to get to this convention that he loved called Southern Comfort. This is Robert speaking to his, as he put it, his brothers and sisters at um, Southern Comfort telling them that he would not be there next year, but he would be there with them in spirit. And um, he wished them all the best things he could. And this picture shows Lola wheeling him off to their room in his wheel. And to, Robert was a very re, uh, religious and spiritual person. And as Lola was wheeling him out, I thought, hmm, that sort of almost looks like uh, a cross, something. Anyway, it, uh, Robert was a, good, was a really good friend of mine, and it was very sad when he died in January. In February, Lola received a package at her doorstep, and it was from Robert, who had arranged this well in advance. It, he had a card and chocolates for Lola so that she would be remembered on Valentine's Day. I'm going to just tell you quickly about another person who was very important in the community and also to me in the 90s. Uh, this is Nancy, who was a great activist in the community, an MIT graduate, a highly um, uh, political and intelligent person who somehow had great persuasive powers. and. Um, made, made uh, substantial political changes. The three pictures, though, that I'm going to show you of her don't show that. The first picture is of her, nie of her with her niece on the father's boat. And um, here she is with a child, but um, not doing anything sort of forced or grinning or uh, parental. She's just there. This picture of Nancy... Uh, um, 
showing her body, which is a mixed body. It's not, it was so much against the grain in the transgender people, for transgender people um, even then, to, um, because the theory was you were supposed, if you're going to transition, you have to transition all the way, or you're some sort of failure, and you should keep yourself hidden. And this was just not what you were supposed to do. I mean, there was nothing beautiful um, for most people about a mixed body. So the courage of being willing to end, to pose this way was a political gift in its own way. And this is also Nancy, who had been crying all afternoon. And I thought, well, should I leave her alone? Should I, what should I do? And she said, you, you should continue, you should photograph me because I want people to know that transitioning and being transgender isn't always such a wonderful thing. And, you know, there are times when we suffer a lot. Sometimes it can be the hormones some, having an effect. Sometimes it's just bringing up the stories of our past or, the, or what's going on now. And it's, you know, it's not always a picnic. And that is, was another act of generosity. That brings me, I've decided to jump to another decade. This is now the beginning. This is around 2001, 2002. Again, with, there was, the political activism has continued all the way through, but it has changed a lot um, in the last, say, five years because of, partly because of the internet, partly because people have gotten very sophisticated and have gotten into lobbying in very sophisticated ways. But when I photograph these four wonderful people, whose names are Kiwi, Drew, Grover, and AJ, all, uh, all androgynous names, they were very politically active. They were students at various schools, um, two of them at NYU. And one of the things that Kiwi in particular did was to um, unite <clears throat> students from, from many different schools uh, who also identified as gender queer or gender fluent, um, not trying to pass, not trying to um, be fully male or fully female, but just to be themselves with however their gender identity feel, felt right to them. And so <clears throat> I saw that they were being very active and I decided to approach them because I hadn't worked with young people so much before. And this is Kiwi, who is, my, is the cover girl for my second book. And, uh, you know, I'd spent a long time trying to figure out what the cover should be, but it, it, was, it kept being obvious to me. It had to be this picture um, because of all that she represents, the young person. Um, and so, so this kind of Mona Lisa smile. This is uh, Drew, also an NYU student and a friend of hers. Uh, now, some people did want to, were comfortable um, coming across as, as gender queer or gender fluid, or, but some young people were not. This is Monique and Tommy. And uh, these are, there, were, there used to be a conference called True Spirit that, um, took place in, <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., and it included high school students, um, college students, and mostly people well under 30 who were, gen who were questioning their gender or in the beginning of transition or um, in the process. And uh, they, they were wonderful conferences, but they don't exist anymore. But in, if you look at these young people, you can sort of get a sense of what was going on. We were sitting on the floor because um, a lot of the people there were too young to drink and, and also too poor to go out for dinner, so we got ourselves a picnic and sat on the floor. Now, it's not just young people who don't necessarily want to define um, as male or as female. It, it, um, the, um, it, there have always been some people who really, this is Sam, who really does not want to be part of 
the attributes of femininity or the attributes of masculinity, but just to be Sam. Um, this picture was taken in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and this is also, this is a very young person who is in the process of transitioning um, as a student and is also a sex worker, which I found fascinating. Um, also, if you've noticed, there, the tattoos are pretty incredible, the transgender community. I always think tattoos are interesting if they signify something, and they do. Very often they are very important. Uh, these are two young people who I photographed at Southern Comfort. They had just met. They're both transgender. Um, the young man has, I don't know if you can really see it, but on one shoulder, he has the tattoo of a hand on his shoulder. And that is because his father di had died recently and he wanted to feel that his father's hand was always on his shoulder. And this is, this is Maxine, who I photographed at Fantasia Fair. And um, she began her transition after she was tattooed. She's, she is completely tattooed, except for the parts that would show if she um, um, were wearing a dress. So she's very smart about that. But once she did the body modification of changing, uh, of having all these tattoos, which are incredible, um, they were all done in Asia. Then, with that body modification, it sort of gave her permission to also to um, transition, which she did. Uh, this is somebody called named Katie from Alaska, in case you're wondering. You could see that from the tattoos. And uh, I told her I thought she looked like a medieval saint, which kind of <laughs> knocked her out. But... Um, I thought she was um, really beautiful. And this is Tiffany, who you saw before with the baby. And at this point, she's totally immersed in a child's world. She's out in the garden. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Can't show you that. Nope. There. That's Blake. Um, Blake is um, somebody who, very patriotic, loves the military. And, um, of course, never could serve in the military because, um, I mean, even now with, the, um, with getting rid of don't ask, don't tell, uh, that doesn't work for transgender people because, um, you know, they're it just not, not the same thing. So, um, and veterans, transgender veterans have a really bad time. But to cheer it all up and to end this journey, this is Natasha Not Good Enough from the Ballet Trocadero of Monte Carlo and her sister who's dressed as an authority figure. And they are consulting the gender roadmap and asking themselves, where do we go from here? And, and I ask the same question. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, yeah, sorry, um, any questions or comments or? Uh, you know of? Yes. Well, my first book, uh, Transformations, Crossdressers and Those Who Love Them, um, had an enormous effect on the, on the community that I knew um, because it was a positive book that presented them in a warm light. And it, it, it became, it was incredible. It sort of took on a life of its own. It became kind of a yearbook. And people were signing their names next to all their pictures of themselves. And I, stopped, I felt like it had taken off on its own. It almost wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even mine, which made me happy. That was fine. It, um, it was, as I said, it was, it was a very uh, loved book. Um, and I got a lot of interviews, particularly from gay press, for that. Um, 
Now, interestingly, I was always embarrassed because the book was so badly designed, so badly printed, such bad paper stock, and I would, I was fine with letting people from the transgender community have it and look at it, but I was always a little embarrassed uh, with, you know, for people from the fine arts photography community because it was just made so badly. But I was, I'm really happy that it did so much, and it has been all over. It has been all over the place. Um, my second book, The Gender Frontier, which made by Carer, is beautifully designed. And, um, but it has come out at a time when everybody's gotten very much more sophisticated and I uh, think they know a lot about this. Um, and so I have not been getting the, the interviews that I did first of all. Gay press is not interested at all, even though it won the Lambda Literary Award, which is a, an award that is given out by gay community. Um, but I, it's still, I mean, it's still there, and it still is helpful to some people. But not, it, it's because the gender frontier is really about, um, much more about the 90s through to 2004, it, it represents much more of a, um, um, the political side, which people often don't like looking at. Um, I have a surgery in there. I have um, a lot of pictures that I really like a lot, but uh, maybe um, it's are harder in a way for transgender people to look at, uh, which I knew, was, I knew that would be the case, and I took that risk. And I think that ultimately it will it will continue to be helpful. Now the rest of the world is is sort of waking up in this direction, and so I uh, try to get the books. Uh, there were very I should say there are very few copies left of the of the of the, of, the, uh, of transformations, and I was curious. I was looking it up in Google to see what was going on with it because it's out of print. And it's now being sold as a collector's item, so which is uh, kind of exciting. The gender frontier is, is still in, is still around. And uh, did I answer that at all? <laughs> I'm rambling. I also should say I brought another book with me that was a group project of five photographers and a writer. It's about the Greenwich Village Halloween Parade, um, and uh, which. It's, it's a, both an amusing book and a very sad book because so many of the, the creativity that you see in that book um, is gone. So many of the people are gone. It came out in 94. So, um, so it's poignant. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, going back to the picture we saw of the Mardi Gras early on, yes. Uh, after yeah. breakfast, uh, yeah, you you took the picture. There were nine people, I think. You said something about that I th uh, would, would like you to elaborate on about when when you looked through the viewfinder and you knew that it was something that that was going to be meaningful to you, that, or that you would continue to investigate. Could you elaborate on that? It was just one of those. It, it, you know, it's so seldom that one actually has an image of the exact moment when something changed in your life. I mean, it. I just had such a strong feeling when I looked through the camera right into, straight into that person's eyes. I felt like I was looking um, into somebody's soul. And I know that sounds a little hokey, but it's what happened to me. And I was just really lucky that that, that person was the one who lived near me in New York. and. Uh, that it was so easy for us to become friends and become, and I feel like, you know, one of the reasons I was talking ab about the, the Fales Library um, is that I feel like we've, we've gone around in a circle. Vicki gave me entree to, a <clears throat> to another world, and I, and I have essentially uh, given, given her art a life on its own. I mean, very soon, you will be able to see her work. Just go, you will be able to go to the library and, and look for her work. And 
somehow that moves me greatly because I feel like I completed a circle for her, with her. <clears throat> You're next. Somebody else is coming first. <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh, actually you just mentioned the thing that uh, first really moved me and that is the fact that, uh, and Alan touched upon it, upon it in his introduction, saying that uh, this really is historic work, and it's so critical to, for the transgender community to be able to see the history. And the pictures, um, they do have a tremendous amount of uh, dignity and, they, um, and vulnerability, but I would also say humanity and every one of them are just so human and you could tell that there's no judgment and, and you could tell the affection that you have for the subjects and um, I mean it, it is it's it's it really is uh, critical it really is a matter of life and death for a, a lot of these people um, just knowing that as a gay man um, to be able to see that history um, and to, con to con connect your life to that um, is really amazing and um, I, th I think it's just absolutely profoundly wonderful that you're able to do that and uh, thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and one other, just one, other, one question. Uh, I did the pictures that you uh, showed of some of uh, the current generation. Uh, how do you feel about the current generation? Right. I mean, I've actually met many of them, and I, I think they're just wonderful. They're I agree. Of fresh air. Yeah, I I agree, and I would I plan to um, work with more of them. Um, I think that it's incredible. I, I mean, it's so amazing if you think of how a community has moved from this level of shame and total embarrassment with self to young people who are now out in the world, um, going to school, taking gender studies courses, um, and being totally, yeah, lovable people. I, um, I be I'm became very fond of Kiwi and the, the other people I know. And I actually initially, was afraid of approaching them because I thought, why would they want to talk to me? <laughs> why would they want to hang out with me? I mean, you know, remind them of their mothers or something. But um, I didn't find that at all. I found that they were very receptive and interested and gave me access. I went visiting homes and just spending time here and there. and. Uh, so I'm very grateful to them, and I'm, I think it's wonderful. And it's the whole, I mean, if you think what, what else is happening, at this point, children are transitioning. And this is, an, this is a very controversial and interesting area that I have complicated feelings about. But, but my point is that it's moving. It's moving so fast, all of this. Um, I guess that's... I should, I'm going to add one other thing. Since you were, you were saying such nice things, I'm going to just say one other thing that is related to that. In the days when Transformations first came out, there were people who actually came to me and said, you saved my life, you saved my marriage. There was one person in the wheelchair who said, I, I read your book, I look at your book once a week so I can go on. And I mean... <laughs> That's such a gift to have had that experience, to know that you can make a difference. It's, you know, what more can you ask for in a way? So thank you for saying so. Uh, no? Usually I don't have to use a microphone. <laughs> My it's being but, recorded, that's why. Oh, but, but I was wondering, uh, as you were developing your friendships with a lot of the members of the transgender community, were there any issues of integrating your transgendered friends with your friends from before and your normal family and? One, 
one of the, well, I was married until 1994 when my husband died, and we would often have parties and combine our usual friends with our more unusual friends, and it was a lot of fun. People really enjoyed it. I mean, sometimes there were awkward moments. Um, you can't always tell how a person's going to behave in company, and there were moments where I would have liked to have skipped it, but generally speaking, it went very well. <laughs> <coughs> um, my children were, if you want to put it that way, ex exposed to uh, variations in gender identity um, from an early age, and I can tell you one slightly funny story. A friend of mine was doing a book reading recently, and her name is Susie Bright. You probably have heard of her. Um, at least some of you have heard of it, her. And um, she, I have photographed her a couple of times, and the second time, she put on a wig and a whole costume, and, and my younger daughter, who was about four at the time, said to her, are you a man or a woman? And Susie said, I'm a woman. And Julia said, no, you're not. And, and, and uh, uh, Susie said, yes, I am. And, and so we talked about it at this book, and I said, well, you know, Julia's the expert. <laughs> um, so what, one other Julia story quickly for my old friends. Um, Julia was with was six years old at the time. She was with a friend of hers and the friend's mother, and they were at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, in that huge elevator. And uh, suddenly Julia pipes up, my mom is an artist too. She photographs naked people and transvestites. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? <laughs> I wanted her to be here tonight, but uh, she's the one with the chocolate pudding. Just uh, <laughs> oh, hi, Mariette. Yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about how you've traveled to different places and the other yeah. um, cultures that you've photographed, and kind of what that brings to your work? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I restricted this to work in the United States. I have um, photographed in Thailand, Burma, um, New Zealand, Australia, I guess a little bit in Europe. Uh, I, Africa? Well, no, couldn't get any in Africa, unfortunately. Uh, and in China, I only could do work in Hong Kong. But um, I still feel that my, that, well, what I should say is, first of all, I could almost only get, except in one case, only get male to female um, people who, it, and except for perhaps uh, New Zealand and Australia and the other countries in Asia, they all, um, believe that sexual orientation and gender identity are um, certain or are tied together in a different way. We have a kind of flexibility about it. You can be gay or straight. You can, it's, it, gender is about how you identify yourself. Uh, sexual orientation is how you want to partner, to be simple about it. And there were very, very few people that I found who didn't say, well, of course I want a male partner, a female to, a male to female. Of course I want a male partner. Why wouldn't I? Well, you know, it's like a joke if I asked. Um, that was one thing that struck me. It was very, I, I think what I would need to do really is to spend a much longer time getting to know a whole community. I feel like the work I've done abroad is still pretty superficial. Um, but what I found was, in, in a way, I found it, because of the level of superficiality, I found it much less interesting. I didn't see the, var the variations that I find here in this, um, I guess in, you could say not just in the United States, but in most of the northern, or the East the Europe, um, and Australia, New Zealand, which is more like our way of thinking about it. 
I would like to do more. In fact, I am planning to go to Cuba to do this work there. I hope it comes about. That would be um, in October. So I'm, I'm uh, working on having that happen. And I think that could be, that should be fascinating. Um, it may not be though that different. It may be the same, the same uh, feeling of combining orient, sexual orientation and gender role as, as, as obvious, you know, that it has to be one way and that otherwise it doesn't make sense. So we'll see. Yeah, Linda. So Mary, you touched on what I was gonna talk about, this intense passion and desire and time that you put into these relationships to make pictures. I, I imagine some of these people that you spent a lot of time with before you took the pictures and uh, that led to then finding out, I hope you can get a grant to spend more time in Cuba. But tell me, some of the people, you didn't photograph them right away. How long did it take to build that relationship? Well, it's a good question because it varied so much. There are people who I photographed over and over again and I just couldn't get a picture that worked. Other people who somehow or other, it came very quickly. Um, the family with the children, I mean, I have known them for about 20 years. I have watched every stage of development. And for some reason, it's still hard. Some people are very much on all the time, as you know. Um, and unlike somebody like Nancy, who I mentioned, um, who had the gift of just being herself in front of the camera, it varies so much. You've, but one does have something of an instinct. You know, I, I go to conventions very often and I think, what is it I'm looking for now? What kind of human being do I want to meet? Or how or what? And generally speaking, especially in the past, I, that person would somehow pop up, you know? And it, was, it would be interesting. Um, Maybe it was my focus, but I remember one convention. I walked in the door, and there was this lovely cross-dresser standing there. And I had already said in my mind, I want to meet somebody from Florida, because my husband, who was very sick at the time, was going to go to Florida. And I wanted somebody there. Where do you think this person was from? And had a house and a boat right in Key West, which is where he was going. and. I knew the name of his son without ever having met him. To the extent when I said, and, and, your, what, and what's your son's name? It went out of his head and into mine. I thought, this is weird, this is weird. I <clears throat> don't usually mention that, but it happens sometimes. But I'm mentioning because I know you're that way too. <laughs> okay, any other? I've, I've led you off on a sidetrack here. I know that's... Uh, um, I, I mean, if there are no more questions um, or comments, why don't you feel free to look at books and meander and wander and, um, and ask me questions? Oh, Margaret. <clears throat> um, Maria, wh what is your sense of the level of acceptance, even in the United States here, given our current divided mm. political, socio-political situation. I mean, do you feel people are more accepting in general? Or just thought you'd yeah. maybe want to comment on yeah. that. I think uh, the question, I don't know if you heard her, the question is, are people more accepting now? And I say definitely so. And <clears throat> a lot of progress is being made. However, statistics, <clears throat> only about one third of the United States has laws against discrimination for transgender people. One third. If you look at it geographically, that, and that's kind of dotted. It doesn't mean it's a whole state. It could be a section of a state. It could be one little town somewhere does have anti-discrimination laws. And then the, another city in the same state might not. New York City does. Albany, I'm pretty sure, does not. You know, it's very dotted. And it, a lot of it has to do with who, ha, which local group or person 
was really active in that area, and also the nature of that area. So, I mean, the very strange thing, like with Robert's um, illness, the fact that he could get a doctor in rural Georgia, but not in Atlanta, I mean, that's really freaky. But I do believe there's more going on, and there are still, there's still murders, there's still hate murders, there's still, um, it's not finished. It's not finished at all. And, um, you know, it's beginning to start, though, in, in lots of parts of the world. I mean, places you would never expect. Very fascinating things happening. Um, which is it? Now I've forgotten. There's a country in um, one of the Arab countries where it's okay to be transsexual but not gay. So a lot of gay people do, do you, a lot of gay people go ahead and have transsexual surgery because they want to be with a man or whatever, and because they could be. In most of Africa, you could be you thrown in prison or even killed if you're gay or transgender. It's so serious. Um, it's such it's such a serious offense. Um, and then. You know, in other places you just wouldn't expect. There are all sorts of so all sorts of other kinds of customs. I mean, there's a part of Eastern Europe where there's been a tradition for centuries in a family where they don't have any um, Romania. Is it? No, I thought it was. No, I think it's. I don't think. But anyway, the. Um, they will turn <clears throat> one of their daughters, if, if they don't have any, um, any men, sorry, I got it mixed up. <laughs> it's so difficult, you know, this. Anyway, um, if they don't have any men, they'll, they'll turn one of their daughters and have her live as a man. It's not Romania, it's Albania, right. Yeah, yeah, I knew it was Romania. Um, so I guess, does that answer it at all? Yeah, it's better, but not there yet, to summarize it. Um, does any, anybody um, want to say anything who actually would not, is actually part of that community? I don't want to embarrass or make anybody uncomfortable, but um, I'm not the only one who knows about this area. No? OK. Um, um, any other comments or questions? Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> Please join Marriott for our book signing here, or to say hello to her, we'll be over here. Thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>